This is total. Hey, hey, what the hell are we, re are we recording? Yeah, and you're screwing up the intro. What about my part? It's supposed to be our podcast, right? Come on, man. I'm trying to be professional about this. You know damn well there ain't nothing professional about what we're doing here. <laughs> Welcome to Totally Unprofessional. It's Manuel and Justin, his two best friends shooting a breeze about nothing and about everything. We're separated by 10 years. Two points of view on every subject from two different generations. Listen as we talk sports, events, and anything else that might come up. There's nothing professional about what we're doing here, hence the name, Totally Unprofessional. All right. We are here. It is the Monday edition, episode 13. Quick turnover this week. Yes, very fast. Uh, our last episode was the Saturday edition. There's a special UFC 199 viewing slash podcast edition. I just want to say that it sounds like Justin here, but there's really a lobster sitting right in front of me. <laughs> He's red as shit right now. Spend uh, a Sunday in Pismo and uh, overcast sun rays still do beat the shit out of you. And here's the funny part. You go over there to get away from the heat. Mission accomplished. But you don't get away from the damn UV rays, do you? No. <laughs> uh, I actually wore sunscreen and uh, on my arms and chest and back because suns were out, guns were out. But uh, my face, on the other hand, <laughs> took a beating. Beat the shit out of me. <laughs> I was going to say, I saw one of the pictures online and I saw you without a shirt and I was like... Man, I hope that fool put on some sunblock. Yeah. That's <laughs> gonna that's gonna hurt. The last time you had to postpone the tattoo appointment. Yeah, because my arm got fried during yeah. the softball game. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm straight up uh, lobstered out, Sebastian, right now. <laughs> uh, uh, so yes, yesterday I, I spent the day in Pismo, but there was still action going on. Uh, Saturday, after we finished recording Saturday's podcast. Uh, we had the co-main event and main event of UFC 199, Uriah Faber and uh, Dominic Cruz for the Bantamweight Championship went down as I predicted, Dominic Cruz winning. Uh, it went the distance. Uh, Dominic Cruz it, is not a finisher. It did, and you know what, though? Uh, we had talked about it before. You asked me if I thought who I thought would win, and I said Faber because he had some tricks in his sleeve. You know, he's an old fighter. Right. Um, he was doing fine until he got caught with that right hand, and then he wanted nothing to well, do with it. Well, the him. first round, he wrestled him a lot, and they scrambled a lot. There was a lot of different position change and, and stuff like that, and I didn't think that, you know, neither one of the guys expected the first round to go that way. Yeah. But then once they started swing or trying to swing, and Faber, like you said, got caught, he got real gun shy real fast. He wanted and just nothing to do with it. Three, him. four, and five would not pull the trigger. Those were ugly. That That's a... To me, if I'm a fighter, um, that's not how I want to go out. No. I don't want to be remembered as not being able to throw those punches. But, I mean, know. as we saw, that was his 42nd, <clears throat> yeah. or, or excuse me, 43rd fight. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and he's in his late 30s. I yeah. mean, he's, he and he's not like a heavyweight. When you're in the lower weight division, it's a young man's game. Because yeah, it's about it speed is. and footwork and that kind of stuff. It's not about power and how you can knock somebody yeah. out necessarily. Which, which makes a lot of... Uh, I don't want to say a lot of sense, but it makes what Mayweather did a little more unique because he is an older fighter, and he did maintain his speed and footwork over a lot of the younger fighters. So I'm not a Mayweather advocate, but um, you don't see it real often. These older fighters, I mean, we saw it, we saw it happen to Bernard Hopkins. Um, you even saw it happen to Randy Couture. He just he slowed down. Tough, greedy, heart. Oh, yeah, all of the above. But physical capability of a 20-something-year-old versus a 40-something-year-old that's a big difference. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can't do. I mean, shit, even now at 38, I'm feeling things that I can't do that I could do five years ago, you know? So you definitely show it. Um, thank you, Uriah, if this was your last fight. Uh, he gave us some real good fights down the stretch, you know? He uh, he put on a show when he was younger. Um, he'll be remembered as a good fighter. Uh, sure. The main event, Luke Rockhold, Michael Bisbee. Yeah! I tell you what, <laughs> I predicted that Rockhold would win and handle Bisbee, uh, but... I'm hold on, not, hold on, and what did I predict? You predicted the underdog <laughs> that there was something different about him that you saw yeah. watching all the stuff leading into it. And you were right, 100% right. Uh, so in that regard, I was happy for him. Yeah. I wasn't mad that he won. I'm not, like, I thought it was cool that, you know, this fight was going down and that Rockhold came in with that swagger kind of cocky attitude and that Bisbing was not going to just lay down and no. take it. But Rockhold, admittedly so, 
as much as he hated to eat that piece of crow pie. <laughs> he ate it. Humble pie <laughs> sucks, don't it? Real fast. And he had to eat that shit right in front of the world. And um, how often do you hear a fighter actually stand up and say, you know what, I overlooked this guy. Um, I was a little too cocky. Uh, hey, hats off to Rockwell. He, he spit it out. Hey, you know what? I took him for I took him too light. I took him for granted. Um, I didn't give him the respect that an MMA fighter deserves, and I got caught. What else is there to say? You know, I mean, that was hats off to him. Not a lot of guys lose like that and then stand up and say that. They just want to run away and cry for a little bit. Right. Um, but as quickly as he was humbled and spoke kindly of him <laughs> in the cage, things went real sour in the post fight <laughs> conference backstage. Um, I thought it was interesting that Bisbing was having a little fun and he was cool. He tried to show Luke some respect. He tried to give him props for being a fighter. He hold on, even, hold on, hold on. Let, let's quote him. I want to be an asshole right now, but I need to be humble. That's what yes, Bisbee yes. said after the fight. I, I want to be an asshole, but I'm going to be humble here. You know what? At that point, to me, I'm not one of those big UFC homers. I, we've talked about that. But be an asshole, dude. If this That's guy, your moment. If this guy's been talking trash, you don't know what's going to happen the next time you fight him, and we're going to assume that there's going to be a rematch at this point. You don't know what's going to happen. you got to take your chan- your shots right now. you got a chance to be the asshole. Be the asshole. Who cares about being the bad guy? We talked about LeBron. Embrace it. Yeah. You had a chance right there to shove it right back down Rockhold and say, well, <laughs> well, after he knocked him out, then he jump up on the cage and he yelled out, fuck you. That was <laughs> that hilarious. Was, that was awesome. To see him point at him in, like, in big words. Like, it wasn't even like a quick no, one. It was like, oh. fuck you. Yeah, like, that was drug awesome. it out. Uh, backstage, he even went as far to say that Luke – to, is an, a special athlete because to get to being a champion, it takes that caliber of person and yeah. athlete to do those things. So he tried to show him some love and some respect for it, stuck his hand out across the podium, yeah. went to shake his hand, and Rockwell was like, fuck <laughs> that, not happening. And they had a, another verbal exchange on the way out where Bisbing said some things that uh, in the moment he didn't really think too much about how many people were recording it and... and and stuff like that, which I think hopefully there's no repercussions for that. It's, nah. I understand how sensitive people are with the media and everything. Yeah, that's kind um, of crazy. But it was amazing. First round, early first round. It was and awesome. as soon as the fight started, <laughs> you and I talked about what we saw when we came in. And, yeah. and I looked right at you and went, he's too relaxed. Immediately. Yeah. And you're like, what? I go, he's dropping his hands. hands yeah. He's not moving very well. He's thinking he's just going to pick him and get him one time here or there. And you're yeah. like... Dude, Bisbing's too aggressive. He's going to catch him. And sure as shit, the next time, first thing you said is, Rockhold's leaving his chin up. What? (laughs) Crack. And it's over. Um, And there's a great picture on Bisbing's Instagram, if you follow Michael Bisbing on Instagram, of Rockhold literally against the cage, (laughs) head down like asleep as John McCarthy's pulling Bisbing off of him. That's friggin' awesome. It's it's a great picture. Uh, (laughs) Now, the other... News that came out. We talked about on the podcast that they announced Connor versus Nate too while we were recording. Uh, Lesnar as well. They showed a promo for Lesnar. They announced his opponent this morning. He will fight Mark Hunt at UFC 200, which you will be there. So you'll get yeah. to see Brock Lesnar compete, which is awesome. Oh, that's a badass picture. It looks like. <laughs> it looks yeah. Like... <laughs> it's dope, right? That is awesome. We'll have to repost that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so. That being said, there was one other story that, unfortunately, for as awesome as the fights were with Hindo's elbow to Hector Lombard. Do we want to get into this one yet? Yes. You want to to go over the other stuff first and then come back to this? No, no. It it pertains to MMA. We're already here. Um, The big thing, and it was a very interesting thing, if you follow MMA closely or if you just look for sources, a name that you will hear and see multiple times over is Ariel Hawani. For those of you who aren't familiar with MMA... This is the Adam Schefter of yes of of uh, MMA, MMA. Uh, not ever, just the UFC but MMA. Of MMA. I didn't say UFC. I said MMA. Okay, this guy is is on the edge with sources, and he's just got his info. He knows where to get his info from, and a lot like Schefter will come out and pretty much spot on most of the time. This guy is comparable to that in the MMA world. All right, go ahead. So, apparently, prior to the main event of Biz being Rockhold, somebody. From the Zufa staff, PR staff, came to Ariel and said, we want you to come to the back. Dana wants to talk to you. Now, for those of you who don't know, Ariel runs uh, SB Nation's MMA Fighting on YouTube. He does a, a MMA hour, which actually is like a three-hour podcast. 
that you can get on uh, iTunes. It's the video of it is on YouTube because he has multiple fighters Skype into his podcast and talks to them, which is very cool. Uh, it's usually about 20 minute segments with each guy or coach, and then he reports what he knows. Now, if you remember back, if he that name had come up in March with Fox. He was fired by Fox because he released the information that Nate and Connor had got their deal done as the replacement for uh, Connor Dos Anjos. The UFC was not happy with that. And then to add to that, he had had Rory McDonald on his show, whose contract is up after his next fight, which is coincidentally enough coming up here shortly. Yeah. And they talked about free agency yeah. and how it was encouraged to explore your options. Now, Ariel owes no allegiance to the UFC. He is a journalist and a reporter for MMA specifically, not the UFC, not Bellator, not anybody else, not World Series of Fighting, not anybody specific. He is a journalist, and it is his job to report what he knows and what he can. Now, Fox let him go because their deal with the UFC. If you ask him or you ask fighters that are involved in this situation, they will tell you that Fox does not say a bad word about the UFC because of this TV contract deal. Because they get Fox Sports 1 Ultimate Fighter set up. They get Fox Sports 1 Memorial Day weekend fights like that. Yeah. Fox, the main channel of Fox, puts on cards every so often. I think it's like one every quarter or yeah. something like that on regular TV. They have a humongous deal with them. So you will not hear negativity come from Fox about the UFC or its fighters in Dana White. It costs too much money. Yes. So Ariel was let go because of that. Because of the free agency talk and the leak of Conor Nate. He was not mad. He did not speak badly of them. He did not even get, tell people what he was told in a phone call where he was released from Fox. Fast forward to Saturday night. He goes to the back. Talks to Dana White. He, bring, he said, this is what he said on Rich Eisen's show this morning. He would not go to the back unless somebody got to come with him, which turned out to be his videographer who films a lot of his stuff for YouTube and stuff like that. They both go to the back. They both get their credentials taken away to for Dana White, who is standing in the back, who tells him he's gone. Lifetime that ban. He is, is what banned he for him. life from the UFC. That Lorenzo Fertitta hates him, <clears throat> that they don't want him anymore to go cover Bellator because this shit is over with them. And when he asked why, why even made mention of Lesnar being upset that this was leaked. Because if you follow Ariel's Twitter, as the fights were going, before the main card started tonight, that Saturday night, he leaked that there was a possibility that Brock's deal was going to be done soon. That he was interested and he wanted to get it done. He also reported that the Nate Connor deal was done. Yeah. Before had anything had been yeah. talked about or shown. Now, people who <clears throat> follow Nate on Instagram, we talked about the slapping. The UFC reposted that slap video yeah. once they announced that he was done. Ariel reported this ahead of time. <laughs> One of the things that he pointed out on Rich Eisen's show this morning was, guess what? He's three for three. He hasn't been wrong. <laughs> so, in this whole interest of things, if you follow Ariel's work, you know he is the most respected journalist in MMA. He is a six-time, six-time, excuse me if I can speak correctly here, six-time MMA journalist of the year. He is a he graduated from Syracuse. He is he mentioned that he does follow other sports more than MMA, uh, like just MMA. That he's well versed in many other sports, but MMA is his passion. He cares about this sport, and he's been around for a very long time. Bryce Rotani Cole, who was on the podcast last Monday. He has spoken, uh, when we heard about this, he was around and I talked to him if he had seen anything like that. He said he remembered in 2008 when Ariel was around uh, Extreme Couture when he was training. Just talking to different people that just wanted to talk hmm. to report news. Not looking for anything to dig dirt, but just being essentially a fighter's reporter to just get people exposure. Yeah, you know He is very well respected in the fighter community. He's very well respected around the world as a credible journalist and reporter. The UFC did not like the fact that he leaked this. Dana White was, the quote from Ariel was that Dana White said that this could have been a deal breaker with Brock with the fact that that was leaked early. Whose fault is that? 
Is that Ariel's fault or is that Dana and the UFC's fault? That's the UFC's fault. Because Ariel's doing his job. Yeah. That's his job. He doesn't owe the UFC anything. And if anything, not I'm not saying that the UFC needs Ariel or that they need that exposure. He gives them a platform and their fighters a platform every week to go and talk about what they do. To go and get that word of mouth publication that you're not going to get a whole lot of other places. Can you see video packages on TV? Yes. Can you hear things on the radio from time to time? Yes. But do you have somewhere on a consistent basis that you're not paying for? Yeah. Nobody's paying Ariel from the UFC to put those fighters on every week. Ariel's not paying those fighters to be on his show. That's free publicity. And the UFC just gave him the finger and told him to fuck off for that. Dana said it would be as long as he's around. Yeah. So this comes into play and immediately... This becomes the 1A story behind Bisbee because everybody knew Dominic essentially was going to retain. Hindo's knockout was great, but this story superseded Hindo's knockout. The only thing that was bigger than this story was Bisbee's knockout of Rockhold. This definitely put a negative spin on Saturday night. It definitely dampens things going forward if Ariel Hawani is not allowed to be around the UFC because he has been, and in my opinion... For the time being, will be the voice of MMA. Not the UFC necessarily, as Joe Rogan and Mike Goldberg are those announcers, but on a public, journalistic view, Ariel Hawani has been the voice of MMA now for a number of years. Yeah, it's been a while. And to disrespect somebody like that because you're worried about having information leaked, this is the day and age that we live in that nothing is safe in that regard. You know, not to compare UFC and WWE as sports wise, but on keeping things under wrap and surprises, it is very hard when anybody can pick up their phone and snap a picture of somebody in an airport, or they can take a picture of somebody walking in or out of a building. It's very easy to get caught and not something not be a surprise. Yeah. And those are random street people. Do you ever go to those people's Twitter or those people's social media and find out what their real name is and then ban them from buildings? No. 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 This is about the ego of the UFC here. Yes. Or do we even say UFC or do we say Dana White here? I think it's because both. This is this is beginning to be problematic with Dana White and getting standoff about certain things. I read a couple of reports. They're calling him thin skin. Yes. He's pouting. He's a baby. If it doesn't happen his way, it's not the right way. This guy's way out in left field right now. The question I got for you, you know this better than I do. Did he damage in, damage any of the UFC image? Did Dana White damage Yes, anything? did Dana White Absolutely. damage it? Absolutely, 100%. Yes. Because he just made them look like the spoiled brats of MMA. Yeah. Because they are the top of the food chain in MMA. We've talked about that. <clears throat> World Series of Fighting, Bellator, they're not competition to the UFC right now. Unless they get other fighters that come want to come down to them and want to work with them and all that business. The top cream of the crop athletes are in the UFC. And you just shit on somebody who did nothing wrong. Yeah. Who did his job. <clears throat> what does that tell you that he'll do to people that is... Un- that, that guy's not under contract with UFC. to them. Yeah. He doesn't own Ariel Hawani's rights. Yeah. What does that mean he'll do to you if he owns your name? And he thinks you crossed him in any way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That definitely sent the wrong message Saturday night, rolling into 200 after all the excitement and the promo videos and everything they've done to build UFC 200 as the biggest, baddest card that they've ever had. It's a landmark card for them. It's a landmark moment for them to be in the new T-Mobile arena. Yeah. And you just totally turned a negative light on you. And there, And in this situation... Badass fights and badass commercials and promotion is not going to turn that away. Nobody's going to turn a blind eye and go, well, I know that that's what's going on. But here, there's going to be people that feed the machine. It is what it is. People are going to pay their money and go and watch. And some people that are MMA fans are there for the the blood and the the guts. And that's true. But if you are a genuine MMA fan, this pisses you off to some degree. It may not like excite you so boiling mad. But it definitely pisses you off to some degree because Ariel Hawani is very respected and has done nothing as far, in my opinion, as far as reporting the UFC's you know, signings or breaking news yeah. to cross any lines and do anything that anybody in the NFL, if it was Adam Schefter or if it was uh, uh, John Clayton, yeah, you know, or anybody, Tim Kirchin in baseball, 
You know, he never has crossed any of those lines that none of those guys have. He was even quoted as saying a few years back, Dana White sat down with him and said, you need to be the guy that doesn't care what the repercussions are. If you want to be the guy in your line of work, you're going to piss people off and you have to understand that it's okay to do that. (laughs) That came from Dana White's mouth to Ariel Hawani. Yeah, he was a different guy back then. He's not as looked at. So MMA Fighting and SB Nation did put out a statement. statement. And they said they fully support Ariel, Casey, and Esther, which is Ariel's crew. Yes. Um, and the entire MMA fighting staff, they appreciate the support they received from the MMA audience and community. Um, there's his bosses right there backing him up saying, hey, he didn't do shit wrong. Yep. You know? So does Fertitta got to go into damage control for this, or will it just blow over? <clears throat> if, if it was any indication on what they did with Connor, right or wrong, they're going to stick to the guns. Because they look like fucking <clears throat> idiots if they don't. There, to the right move would be to admit that they were wrong and say he was just doing his job we overreacted that was our fault because a statement from the UFC to Ariel Hawani was you should have checked with us first yeah anybody in their right mind in a business sense knows what the answer to that would have been if he would have checked with them on both of those don't say anything yeah or no. Wait. Which he was quoted, Ariel was quoted as saying, it's happened before when he worked with Fox where he had information and they made him sit on it. They would not let him do it because he had a deal with Fox. Yeah. So he was not allowed to speak on things like that. And now he doesn't have that worry. So Which is just... what he said, I don't have to hold back. I don't owe anybody anything. Yeah. Which was, here's a real interesting thing. Rich Eisen has been around for a long time. Yeah. He was on ESPN. Then he branched off into the NFL Network. Now he has his own show and he does the NFL Network stuff, which is great. But he's been around and he's a respected guy. He yeah. does the NFL Combine and all that good stuff. He supported Ariel Hawani. He said, screw the UFC, you need to do you. Yeah. Because if this is what it means for you to be a journalist and a reporter, that's what you should do. Yeah. Even if it means walking away from MMA. Definitely. Definitely. And to me, that was a big shot in the arm because if you're – the MMA – say what you want. We've said this before when I asked you about this in the in the Muhammad Ali sense of how long boxing was been around and how guys used to fight for their livelihood and yeah. not make the paydays that the guys in boxing make now. How we related that to the UFC now being so young – in the sport itself, that guys are fighting for their livelihood and working on this. Yeah. So this, if you're a fan of this, although it gets a lot of mainstream exposure, it's not as much as people think. Conor McGregor set the mainstream world on fire with that retirement quote a while back. Yeah, That was the biggest amount of exposure <clears throat> mainstream they had ever gotten. So if you're in this community, you don't really know how much support you do or don't have until something like this happens. And to have mainstream guys, to have big name guys, to stand up, not just fighters, not just fans, but guys in that profession to say, you were right, you did right. they were wrong. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. That's a big yeah, deal. Definitely. Uh, and, I'd, I'd imagine he's going to have tons of support from the journalist com- yes. you know, community. Um, I, I bet we start hearing from a bunch of the big names starting to come out and support him and say, hey, you're just doing what you do. And uh, that's what journalists do. They piss people off because they're going to leak stuff. But he doesn't like you said. He doesn't know his allegiance to anybody. That's right. Um, it's going to be a real good. I think this will be a career booster for him. I, I think somewhere, so, somewhere, somebody's happy and said, you know what? That's the kind of journalist we want to do that kind of investigation and have that and be able to throw it out there. Did you hear what was said when he was, or read what he was, what was said when he was asked if the UFC were to give his credentials back, would he go back? No, I didn't say. Okay. I was actually looking so, for that. Okay, before I give you that answer, let me ask you that question. <clears throat> if you're in his shoes and they say we were wrong. But they don't. Let's say they don't make a public statement like saying we we're wrong. They just say to him, "We we're wrong. We'll give you your credentials back, and we'll do something to you know honor you as far as try to make it right in the public eye." But we're not going to say we're sorry. We'll just try and save face with us and save face with you, and you can have your credentials back. Hell no. Do you take them back? I don't take that back, and I throw that right back out there into the media. You say, you know what? If they're not willing to apologize to me publicly, because they were sure as hell willing to humiliate him publicly. They're not willing to apologize publicly. Why the hell would you go back? They were talking about Dana said he could go back as a fan and 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 report that way. I don't think SB Nation or MMA fighting will have a problem paying for a ticket for him. Right. You know how much is a front row ticket? Here's the funny part about that. Speaking of that, <clears throat> if he goes as a fan, <laughs> how many people are going to have to be told to stay away from him? Yeah, yeah, because because he's gonna they, be... they'll go to him. Yeah. He and... doesn't have to go to them. They'll come yeah. to him. And there's and he won't even be in the, the designated press area now. Now he'll have just fighters, fans, they'll all have general access to him if he's not in the general 
I don't want to say the general population, but out in the, the normal seating area, you know? He's going to get out there. Fighters will start coming to talk to him, and I bet that pisses Dana off ten times more than this ever did. Yep. You know? So, Dana, man, hey. <laughs> you Stuck your foot in this one. You better take your head out of your ass because this is the second time in a couple of months that you stood up and took a fight. And, well, right now you're not losing this one, but you lost to McGregor when look who's fighting. You Whether know? or not, I mean, the, the deal got done with Connor and Nate, and I understand that was the idea. And it was going to, let's just be clear, it was going to get done. It, it was not a question. But the of way it, that it they handled weird. the situation was bullshit, yeah. and it was wrong. Oh, yeah. And on this one, like, it's one thing that you step up and you say, this guy works in my promotion, and you have some ground to stand on with, you know, we ask everybody to do these things. I get that. But he doesn't have a leg to stand on in this shit. Yeah, not and at he all. not only did he attack his fighter and going against Connor with all that stuff and handling it in the public, but now you just went to the next step, which is your public eye, your promotion, your media platforms that you had. You know that that shit cannot happen because what does that say? Who's next? Yeah. What happens next? I'll take on the media. I'll take on my fighters. You want to do this shit by yourself? You're killing the guy who's your draw. You're killing the guy who's the most vocal and supportive. <clears throat> Not necessarily of Dana, but of the UFC. UFC yeah. He's been nothing but supportive. Even yeah. when he was let go of Fox, he would not say a bad word about them. And to my knowledge, why? Why not be truthful? And I'm glad he spoke up about this. Yeah. I'm glad he revealed what was said and how it was said to him and everything else. As somebody who is new to podcasting like we are, I listen to Ariel Hawani. I listen to how he does his things. I, I'm a subscriber to his podcast. I'm looking for things for us to use in the way he goes about, how what he structures yeah. his stuff around, how he does those things, how he reports his business. <coughs> Excuse me. So to me, this bugs me. doesn't necessarily piss me off, but it bugs me in the sense of, you know, he's just doing his job. Yeah. And he does something that he enjoys. We have, quote unquote, nine to five jobs. That they're not always fun every day, yeah. but they're necessary because these <clears throat> damn bills keep coming and bill collectors don't give a shit whether you like your job or not. Oh, yeah. But to be able to do something that you love, you're doing it the right way. You're not doing anything to harm anybody or to impose an agenda on yeah. anybody for your own self-promotion <laughs> and you get shit on like this. I'm sorry. That's wrong. Yeah. That's yeah, wrong. For sure. And he's a well-liked guy, which yeah. makes it way worse. Yeah, that everything that I read is that they went after the kind of guy that nobody should be going after. Like you said, he does things the right way. You know, he's not he's not out there bashing anybody. And he had a perfect opportunity to go after Fox and the UFC after Fox let him go. He chose not to. Why are you going to do this guy like this? There's no reason to go after somebody I don't like understand that. if you saw him take the high road with Fox. Why you take another shot at him? Did yeah. you really think he was going to be quiet this time? Yeah. Oh, man. I... I you can't. Uh, well, and then we're talking about Dana White, though. Dana White thinks he Here, can. Here's cover something anything I thought of when to. I read this. You take him to the back, you rip his credentials from him, and you tell him to get the fuck out. No, Sounds like an old school Vegas theme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can have your credentials and your story and the hammer, or you can just leave. Leave. <laughs> <laughs> The old Vegas thing. <laughs> you know? That, That's funny. That was interesting to me. That that, that definitely sounded like that. Um, <laughs> That's funny. In, in that regard. But, you know, for us, as I said, I know I can speak for me. I, I don't want to speak for you on this matter, but and I'm sure you agree, though. But uh, I definitely support Ariel Hawani and uh, SB Nation and those guys. Um, Ardo's 100% in the right, and, you know, I hope that he is back reporting, for whether it's UFC or, you know, from a general public standpoint or from behind the scenes, whatever he chooses to do, because at the end of the day, it's his situation, you know, whether we agree with it or not, if he were to go back, if they gave him those credentials, I just hope to see him out there because he's damn good at what he does and he deserves to do what he does at the top level. Yeah, definitely. Um, so moving on from Saturday night's UFC fights and all the craziness of Ariel Hawani. Well, hold on. Let's stay with Saturday night. I, okay. I You walked in. I showed you oh, a little yes, bit of the yes. boxing match. Um we were so tied up with 199 on Saturday night. I forgot there was a pretty good boxing match schedule for Saturday night. I ran across it, ran across it Sunday morning on HBO. Um, you had Francisco Vargas and Orlando Salido fighting for the junior lightweight title. And uh, Salido's not a name you know if you're looking for undefeated fighters or fighters with stiff records. This guy is 42, 13, and 4. Okay, 29 KOs. Not known as a long-term winner, but this guy, he stands in and he fights. He's an old-school Arturo Gatti. The guy doesn't know any other way to fight. He's a box fighter. Vargas is a young champion. He's 23-0-1 at the time. 
This fight ended in a draw. Um, the significance about the draw, it doesn't happen real often. Um, you know, a lot of the times they blow the decision one way or the other, or, you know, somebody takes a split. I mean, this one could have gone either way. I'm glad it was a draw because I've watched it three times since yesterday, and it's been a draw every way. But these guys, you saw this fight. This, these guys were going at each other from the opening bell until the 12th bell. It was nonstop action start to finish. Um, like I said, ended in majority draw. Um, I'm sure we'll see a rematch. Definitely a candidate for boxing fight of the year. Um, might even grab a decade when I haven't seen one that good this year in this decade yet. You know, these guys, uh, two Mexican fighters, one from Arizona, one from Mexico. And these guys just, they mixed it up. They traded it. And if you get a chance to watch it, it'll be on replay probably one more time this week or twice. If not, look it up. I think ESPN will probably have it or HBO uh, on demand. Watch that fight. That restores faith in boxing. Unfortunately, we only have one of those about every year or two, if we're lucky. Um, but those two guys definitely, definitely hats off to him. Um, Vargas definitely looked like he took most of the punishment. But don't get me wrong, he inflicted a lot on Salcido. But Salcido showed his ring savvy from his experience. He showed his ability to take a punch. He did get rocked one time, but he didn't go down. Uh, put a lot of pressure on the younger fighter. Um, kudos to the old man for hanging with the kid. Um, kudos to the kid for stepping up. This was his second fight where he had someone in front of him that was putting a lot of pressure on him. So uh, a lot of big things coming from that kid. He's, he's young. He's got a, a, a definitely a good future in front of him in fighting and boxing. And let's just hope that he doesn't get derailed by uh, Salcido because they're going to have to fight again. They're definitely going to have to fight again. But uh, that's the brief boxing recap there. Um, so we go to Sunday. Sunday, game two. NBA Finals. Uh, as I said, I was in Pismo Beach uh, on my way home at that time. So I was having to keep up with the game on the radio, losing signal going through the hills, and then on my phone. Uh, I know that uh, from what I saw, the game was never really that tight of a game uh, after a certain point there. Um, me being the basketball guy, I do kind of feel bad that I didn't watch the game, but at the same time, I was at the beach at I don't feel that You bad. didn't miss anything. And Cleveland when I never, saw the yeah. score, as we were coming, getting closer into town to where we could have found somewhere to watch, probably the third and fourth quarter, uh, it, it wasn't a game to watch. They were already up by 20. Well, and LeBron and Irving, I think they came out about seven minutes left in the game. It was about a 12-point game when they sat down. They Cleveland just could not mount anything continuous. They would uh, Golden State would stretch that lead to 14 or 15. Cleveland would get it down to six or five, and then it would blow right back up. Now... I don't know if you saw this, but I didn't. I just saw a still frame of it. Apparently, Harrison Barnes caught Kevin Love with an elbow to the head. Yeah, so Love was uh, in a box-out position, and he's looking up towards the board, and he came right over the top of Love. And as he's going up, um, it's totally incidental. It wasn't it wasn't uh, flagrant or anything. But as he's going up, he's reaching with his arms up towards the ball, and that elbow caught him right behind the head. I mean, it... I, you dare call it the perfect storm because that could not have been any more of a precise hit on that spot on his head. You know, I'm sure it hit right below where you feel the crane, the cranium like start to bend there in the neck. And I'll tell you what, man, he hit the floor fast. And not only that, he did come back in. They called a timeout right after that. He went out, they sat for the timeout, and then they came back in. He played for a little bit and then took himself out of the game. And that was when the staff said, hey, what's going on? And he said, you know what? Um, I don't remember the quote, but I'm pretty sure he said something like, I'm not I'm not just not feeling it. They took him to the back. He never played again. He's in the concussion protocol. I was just saying, he yet. must be going And he is in the concussion protocol, protocol now. They did uh, say that after the game. So they're thinking maybe, maybe game four. Only because of the spread out, the spread that they have between games right they now. They get a two-game break this time because of the travel <laughs> day in between. They travel to Cleveland today. And then they play uh, Wednesday. Or uh, no, no, excuse me. It's uh, they travel Today. tomorrow and well, play Thursday. Well, Cleveland was going to go back home this morning, and then wait. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they they play tomorrow. It's Tuesday, Thursday. No, they play Wednesday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. They play Wednesday. Yeah. You sure. I'm positive. Um. So yeah, they they uh, they so, went ahead. So yeah. the tra that makes sense because so the travel what they would yeah. be today, and then yeah, that. So makes sense. here's here's what's going to beckon now. Okay, so you got Love was most likely not going to play Game Three. Mm -hmm. Mozgov came in last night. Yes. How did he? What was his showing look like? I'm gonna tell you what. I'm surprised they're not incorporating him more into what's going on. He managed to slow the game down a little bit, and let's be honest, Golden State does not have anybody his size to play with him. No, they don't. 
So Bogut, I, but Bogut's not. He's too slow to keep up with Mozgov. He's an athletic five, is what Mozgov is. So I'll tell you what. From the from what he did play last night, I'm real surprised Cleveland has not gone that way. Especially with LeBron not willing to step up and just get to the get to the basket. The guy looks like he's taking breaks. He looks like he's doing everything uh, but what he's supposed to be doing. He's just he hasn't got going. Irving hasn't got going. Love hasn't got going. Well, guess what? That equals a sweep. That's what that's going to equal is a sweep. Now, I don't want to boast about this, but I did say when you asked me about <laughs> ga- after like before game one and after game one, <laughs> what what happened? Who lost the game for them? Who won the game for them? Who said where? I told you, Cleveland's team. As a whole, with this whole unit together, has not had this experience. No. Now, no. not only in game one did they have a lead and lose it and get handled, this game, they got just outran. Yeah. They oh, got the ran building. out the building. Draymond Green, look, I mean, it's funny to watch Golden now, State. We've talked about their players, but holy cow, it was Draymond Green this game. Stepping up, nail a three. Stepping up, nail any three. Step back, nail a three. It was like, okay, Curry and Thompson were like, yeah, let's just let our boy go for it right here. And Green's going nuts, you know? And it's like, okay, who's next? <laughs> you know? That's, and Curry and, and Thompson... And what did I say on on the podcast that it's that next mentality of next man up? <clears throat> yeah. And this... And Curry game and one, it was still haven't shown they, up. Yeah. They still it was Sean Livingston up. game one. Game two is Draymond, Draymond Green's Green, game. Yeah. I mean... Who do you... If you're watching film, if you're Tyron Lue and his coaching <clears throat> staff, who do you take away? I mean, obviously, you're going to want to get the ball out of Steph's hands. But at this point, with them not having good games, do you let them go? I, I don't I don't think you can. I think Curry's the one you don't want getting hot. I think that Cleveland has shown they can slow down Green and Thompson. Curry's the one that if he gets going, you're done. You're just done because he's going to feel it no matter where he's at on Here's the Here's the problem that you get with it. Who would you say is Cleveland's best defender in their starting fight? It's going to be LeBron. So you're going to put LeBron on Steph Curry, no, right? No, and that's that's the whole thing is that you need because him on now, Thompson or you because need him on no, no, that's not even that. Okay, think of their lineup. If you're the Warriors, Steph at one, Clay at two, Harrison Barnes at three, Draymond at four, and Bogut is their five when they start. Okay. So that means that Draymond Green is now guarded by Kyrie Irving unless you bump everybody else yeah. down one. Yeah. So now Kyrie, let's for argument's sake say everybody gets bumped down the one. Okay. So now you have Kyrie Irving on Clay Thompson. That's a fair matchup. Okay. Like that could go either way defensively. Kyrie's a de- he's not a great defender, but he's got enough of a presence and fast enough to keep up with Clay. Got to get around screens that they run for him, but yeah. task not too tall. Okay. For Kyrie. Now the next one, J.R. Smith or uh, Iman Shumpert, depending on who they're starting that night. You just got bumped down to Harrison Barnes. Yeah. A little bit stronger, but I wouldn't say too tall of a task, except for the fact that Harrison's bigger than they are. Now, J.R. Smith did guard him with some success last night. Yes. That's the funny part, is that that one did work out. What didn't work out was who? Love on Green. Well, this is where this comes in. Love becomes the guy that guards Green in that situation, and then who would they have guarding the five? (laughs) Uh, Tristan Thompson was doing it last night. Tristan Thompson is now guarding the five. Well, this is just my opinion. I don't think that Love has the agility defensively to stick with Draymond Green for four quarters. I don't either. And you saw it yesterday. Tristan Thompson is not fast enough. So here's where the advantage comes in. I don't think in that defensive lineup, if you move LeBron up that far, that you're really falling off if you're Cleveland. In that starting lineup. That's a good idea with the starting group. Remove Andrew Bogut from that lineup. Now everybody moves down a spot except for Steph and Clay. Now you're playing small ball. Draymond Green becomes your five. Yeah. Tristan Thompson's not yeah. keeping up with Draymond yeah. Green on the three-point no, line. he's not. Inside, he'll bust the shit out of him back and forth with him. I'm not saying that one has the advantage over the other, but they'll bang. Yeah. They'll bang with each other. On the perimeter, Tristan Thompson's not going to hang with Draymond Green. He yeah. will get exposed on yeah. his perimeter defense. Now you move back up to the four. Now Kevin Love has to guard Harrison Barnes. Barnes not He's not athletic no. enough to keep no. up with Harrison Barnes. No. Harrison Barnes can guard the perimeter. It do, that's no different than who he guards now. So if Kevin Love steps out, guess what? He knows. Yeah. Now you go back to the three. The three now, for them, becomes somebody else. In this case, probably Andre Iguodala would be the next guy, I would think, off the bench. He's the sixth man. Okay. 
Okay? So you go with him at the three. Okay? Who's guarding the three now? Now it's either Iman <laughs> Shumpert or J.R. Smith. Yeah. I'm not saying that Iguodala is any more athletic than either one of those two guys, but he's a lot more scrappy. Yeah. And definitely. He's the type of guy that will D you up and take you out. Well, now you just on defense. Now look at this reversely also from the other side in the small ball lineup. Can Draymond Green guard Tristan Thompson? Yes. Yes, because Tristan yeah. Thompson's a smaller five. Yeah. Harrison Barnes, we just said, can guard Kevin Love. Yeah. Now you have Andre Iguodala, who guarded LeBron in the entire finals. I'm pretty sure J.R. Smith or Iman Shumpert will be okay to be guarded by one of those guys. Yeah. Which isn't even necessary, because when you go back to defense, guess who gets bummed down and you yeah. go, hey, you're on LeBron, Clay and Steph, you got Kyrie and Iman, or Kyrie and J.R. Smith. Defensively, it does not hurt the Warriors yeah. to go small like it does Cleveland. Yeah. Cleveland's at a disadvantage here. And as much as they may not like it, Mozdov may be the guy to be the one that breaks that ceiling a little yeah. bit for them. Well, that's what it looked like last night. I because mean, although he's a five, he's a five that runs. Tristan Thompson is not. Run, no, you saw that last night. He trailed a lot last night. And I, I hope Cleveland wakes up. I do. I got. I'm in, I a, know. Pool. I'm in a pool, and the more games they play, the more chances I got to I've win. said this on the podcast before, and, and I mean this with all my heart. If you're in Cleveland and you're a LeBron fan, you can eat a big bowl of dicks. I hope they get swept. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to tell you I think you're wrong, but I just don't. I, after last night, I, I know they're in Oakland. I know that yeah, it's yeah, supposed yeah. to happen, but Cleveland just looked, especially once Love Cleveland was Cleveland will game, get one at home. They looked like they didn't belong. I'm not court. saying it's going to be both, but they're going to get one at home. <clears throat> Something will change as far as them being at home, them getting a few more calls, them having an on night finally where everything seems to be in the right place at the right time. They will get either three or four. It's hard to believe that they Cleveland actually had a 2-1 lead on Golden State last year without Irving and Love. I mean, I, they were talking about that last night, and I was like, you're right. They, they did have a lead on them last year. And you were missing two of your better players? Hence wow. why I explained to you on the podcast that yeah. just because they were gone, that that wasn't necessarily better. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just, just kind of crazy. It, way out there. Way out there. I mean, I, I genuinely hope that they do get swept. But do I, realistically, do I see that happening? No. no. See I five? Don't. Maybe six? Yes. Yes. I see them getting one, maybe both at home. And it could be 2-2 two, two going into five. I mean, I, I don't really put that past them. Because they have gotten hot. By the way, your phone just went off, and that That's got recorded. That's a beer. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I uh, I definitely think that this series is not over. Uh, I said that in the OKC series yeah. with the Warriors, that they were not done. I still stand in this particular position. I hope it happens, but realistically, I don't believe that it will happen. I, I see this game going somewhere around 5-6. to six. What, are, what are we doing on time there, Tech Guy? We're at 41 minutes. Oh, oh wow. we've got we're plenty of time. time. So, um... We didn't talk any world matters on Friday or Saturday because we were doing our live. Uh -huh. Did you hear about the gorilla? About the kid that the fell kid in, that fell and, in the the and then they, they yeah. wind up shooting, shooting the gorilla. The gorilla. Yeah. Uh, I just I want gave... to start this one out by uh, saying gorilla lives matter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I w here's the problem that, that uh, myself personally has with this. And it's not particularly this issue with the gorilla and the kid. I have my opinion on it because I vaguely know the details of the story. But the problem with this for me is that when I see shit like this on the news, I go on YouTube and I go down this rabbit hole of looking at animal <laughs> shit like this. And before I know it, two hours later, I'm looking at tiger attacks in Indonesia of a guy that <laughs> fell in the, or not necessarily fell, but climbed in the tiger cage. And it takes me to a whole different place that uh, I wasn't you know, necessarily thinking I was going. But um, there has been a long story a long time running issue around the world not in the states necessarily because it hasn't really been in the media but around the world as i said that a lot of times it's it's over in asia india that that part of the world where people cl either climb into this stuff or they fall into this cage or uh habitat and they don't sit there and do anything to the animal necessarily unless the animal acts out and actually kills or yeah. or gets violent now 
I just said I've been on YouTube and I've fallen down this rabbit hole. <clears throat> I genuinely look into tiger attacks from time to time just because I'm enamored with tigers and the size that they actually are. And, and the mauling they do of humans. And how crazy they are, right? <laughs> I was watching this video of a, a tiger where a guy was in the, the actual uh, habitat and he was in there and the tiger is pawing at him and he's yelling and all this stuff and... The tiger kind of paws at him, scratches the hell out of him a little bit. He kind of like pushes him away with his forearm. And then finally the tiger realizes like, hey, I could eat you. And he bites the shit out of him and drags him off to the back. The people that work for the zoo did not even shut the zoo down. And this tiger took some chunks out of this guy and killed him in his habitat. Oh, damn. Was this animal shot or killed in your opinion? Or should have been in your opinion? Yeah, it's, it's make well, okay, look. No, no, just, you, just from what I just yeah, told no, no, you. Okay, so before so it gets any deeper, this is what, I'll get to a little bit deeper. From what you're telling me, it, it was in a zoo, right? Yes, it was okay. in a, it was in a we, zoo in they India. They create or Indonesia. those those uh, those cages or whatever you want to call it to resemble their habitat. Right. If you've given an animal a habitat, um, it, it even goes back as far as the dogs in the backyard. When someone steps into their habitat, animal instinct is to defend. And we get pissed off when people get harmed in there. Did that animal deserve to be shot? Hell no, it didn't. A foreign obstacle, whether it be another animal or a human being, entered the natural habitat that they know. Their domain. Their, that's their hood. Okay? Right. You're not going in there without something happening. Now, there are you could spread this out among a bunch of different species of animals. But that tiger shouldn't have been shot, in my opinion. Did you have a chance to save the man? Maybe you could think about it at that point. But they didn't realistically. If you watch the video, no. there was no clear cut yeah. way for them to no to uh, why are you trench the, the tiger or anything like again, that. Again, why are you going to shoot an animal that's only de probably defending its habitat? So, to follow this up, they did not shoot the animal. The animal continued in the zoo. Okay. Now, going <clears throat> back to the gorilla story. Okay. All I know is is that the kid fell in. I don't know how old the I heard baby five years old. Okay, five. so it was a small child. I wouldn't say that's child. a baby. It that's a small child. That's a yeah. small child. I heard that uh, it. I don't know that it climbed in, but I heard that it fell in. Fell in, and that uh, the gorilla was almost in a way, kind of like almost checking it all out as like a parenting mm -hmm. type deal. That it didn't go like bananas on it right away. Or anything like that. It's a three-year-old boy. I'm sorry. Okay, so okay, that's closer to a baby. I, I'll give you that. Uh, but I don't know the exact details on whether or not the gorilla like shook the baby or the baby didn't make it out of there or like I don't know the details of that. All I know is that the baby was in there. They had an interaction, and the gorilla did not come out alive. So okay. can you fill me in well, on? There, here's a, okay, so a little bit more of the story. So. There's still not, it's still a little cloudy as to how the child separated itself from the, the mother. There's been a lot of argument about this, and all I say is, if I walk up to an intersection, we use Alta and Almonte here in town, it's a busy intersection, and I'm walking my three-year-old child, I am not going to let go of my child's hand to turn and push the damn street crossing button, which is basically what happened here, especially when... Witnesses are stating the child was yelling. I want to play with the gorilla. I want to play with the gorilla Okay, now you can make whatever argument you want about the zoo and how they protected the cage and what have you Basically, Where was, what this, zoo was this? Cincinnati. So, okay, so home of your bangles. Home of my bangles So the kid climbs over the fence through a little bush and falls over the ledge doesn't know where the edge it falls over the ledge and into I don't want to call it a moat, but it had some water. Ideal, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay lands in there the gorilla sees it Mosey's on over there to see what's going on, okay? Now, mind you, everybody's seen Okay, no, hold on. Before you go any farther, how far was that fall for a three-year-old? saying like 15 feet, I think. If, if I'm... I'll, do, I'll double check the facts here. But apparently... So the kid falls, okay? It's a 400-pound silverback gorilla. If you've never seen a silverback gorilla, they might be the biggest, meanest-looking fucking animals next to humans. I kid you not. These things are massive, okay? So the kid falls in. Gorilla moseys over. Didn't go right after the child, okay? Everybody saw the child fall in, and everybody starts going freaky Bananas. like 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 people do. Oh, my God, the child. Okay? There's a couple of theories as to what happened here. People think... There are a lot of people who think that the gorilla, hearing the excitement and everything, went into protection mode and went over there and grabbed the kid 
and wanted to drag the kid to safety. And the reason they say this is because I'm told, I read an article about the gorillas the other day. They're up to 100 times stronger than an average human. Okay? Um, I don't consider myself average human, but I consider myself a little stronger. If that damn gorilla is even 50 times stronger than me, it's going to do some harm just putting its hands on you. Right. Okay? Having said that, if that gorilla wants to harm you, there isn't shit me, a grown man, considered, and I consider myself fairly strong, I couldn't stop that damn gorilla from hurting me. Okay? Much less a three-year-old child. The videos that I saw, because there's like thousands of angles you're going to get because of people that were there. The angles that I saw showed the, the gorilla trying to pull the kid to safety more than anything. It didn't show the gorilla being aggressive toward the kid. Now, having said that, do you know what's on the gorilla's mind? Most certainly not. We just talked about the habitat. That's the gorilla's cage. It's not the kid's cage. We don't know what that gorilla was planning. Right. The, zoo sa the zoo staff only had a certain amount of time to react to what was going on. They saw the gorilla with its hands on the child and it was pulling the child. That's all they saw. They had to act. Now, there are people, why didn't they dart it? If you read, you really think a 400-pound gorilla is going to get hit with a dart strong enough to put it down instantly? No. Everything I've read said anywhere from 20 seconds to as many as a couple minutes it could take. Plus, once it starts to feel <coughs> stoned, quirky, whatever you want to call it, it might panic, causing harm to the child. More out of panic than out of anger towards the child. So... There was a lot. There's a lot of ways to look at it. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to look well, at it. Well, my and thing is this: fifteen feet to a three-year-old. That's a story and a half fall. Yeah, that's a big. That's a big. That's fall. a damaging fall. I want to make sure. And the only injuries the child sustained were from the fall. See, that's to me. You know, that's a bigger deal. Yeah, twelve Be feet is what. Okay. the kid actually fell. Still, twelve. It's still, feet, 12 that's feet. a story. Yeah, you know, ten feet's yeah. a story. So that's a story fall for a three-year-old. People freak out when a three-year-old falls off the fucking bed. It yeah. fell a story. Yeah. Child lived, minor injuries. Um, there's a lot of backlash from it, both towards the parents, for the parents, against the parents. I mean, and like I said, given the situation, um, the child was alive. The zoo staff had to react quickly. Um, they reacted in the appropriate manner to save the child's life, given the information they had. They didn't observe the gorilla with the child. They weren't trying to figure out what the gorilla was up to. They needed to solve that situation in a heartbeat, and they had to kill the gorilla. Um, I didn't think it was the right move, but then again, that's not my kid in there. Well, but, here's my thing, and I don't have kids. <clears throat> I don't know what that genuine emotion is, but if I'm the parent, do I want that gorilla killed? Nope. He didn't kill my kid. Now, did now, it, Okay, hold on. So was I clear about when they killed it? No, you didn't say. Okay, they so you said that he they picked he, the idea was as the as people. the gorilla has the child. You have a, a mark a marksman right. somewhere outside the cage. I'm going to presume somewhere near the entry point. Stepped in with the rifle, shot the gorilla, so that he couldn't harm the child. Now was the child in the gorilla's not possession? In the gorilla's, not I wouldn't say in possession per se, but I, he looked like he was grabbing the child by the arm and pulling the child in. See, to me, that's a problem. What happens if the gorilla falls on the child? Well, and again, this is. They had a split moment to act, assuming that the gorilla was going to be hostile towards the kid. That was their decision. There was a lot of people that said, okay, idiots, you shoot that gorilla, they're in the moat. He lands on the kid in the moat. Even by the time you get there, which, which will be 10 seconds, the kid's probably dead. You know? I don't understand why you don't make it a two-shot process. You shoot the gorilla in the arm with a marksman to let go of the child, then shoot the gorilla if that's the process you're going. Because, they're, like I said, they're saying that the dart effect on gorillas that big sometimes goes anywhere. No, no, from I'm not talking about a dart shot. Put a hole through his arm to force him to let go of whatever he's holding on to, then do the kill shot. So that way the kid's not being held on to. Every, again, every article that I was reading um, with that pertained to, Whoops. I don't want to say harming the gorilla, but let's say controlling the gorilla... Mm -hmm. Pointed toward the gorilla reacting Jesus. in a panic mode. That count as your phone going off? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a question. Sure. What do y'all think about restraint backpacks? What's a restraint backpack? These little ones with the little cute animal and the big old tail so you can hold the children. <laughs> Funny story. Um, I had Janessa and the twins. Okay, they're close in age. Um, they're, they're a little under two years. Janessa was walking. The twins were starting to walk. And so we didn't want to discourage them from walking, so we made them, we had them walking everywhere. It got to the point where 
Um, even if I was holding both their hands, it was hard to keep track of them because one would go this way. And if they slipped out, you know, you know that's going to happen. Right. So when we used to walk the twins around, <laughs> I used to have body har- something similar to that. They're like body harnesses so that I could actually hold them. So if one's going that way, I'm not losing my arm. I could give her a tug and pull. It looked a lot like walking a couple of pit bulls. But realistically, to me, that was the safest way to keep an eye on my kids. You know, I've seen kids slip out of parents' hands left and right. I've seen parents negligently just turn around. Oh, it was only for a second. What happens when you turn around for a second? They stick their hand in a plug. They turn on a gas stove. There are so many things that can happen when you lose attention with your kid for that millisecond. And look at what happened to this one. Um, the silverbacks, I'm told, are still endangered. You know, that was a, a breeding age silverback that they killed because someone didn't pay 100% attention to their kid. Yeah, because I remember as a little kid, they, my mom would put that on me because that was wild. Yeah, trying not to lose your kid. I mean, and that's, hey, and, and you understanding your kid is, is more important, you know? Yeah, but some parents view it as a, oh, you're treating your kid as an animal. Well, you know what? I, can't, I got a big middle finger. I got two of them, as a matter of fact. They go out to those parents. Take care of your damn kids and nobody else will have to, you know? There's too many kids that run around free and they say, well, they need to be free. No, 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 no. They need to learn control. When your kid is 20 years old on drugs or on alcohol because they don't know how to exercise control, you point back to that one instance you used to let them run around in Walmart, you know. And this kid, unfortunately, um, it cost a gorilla its life. And like I said, I you can't really blame the zoo staff. Um, I blame the parents more than anything. Um, they, I'm sure they've been through some trauma. I would not want anybody that I know to go through that. Um, no, no parent should have to see their child possibly in harm's way. But, man, I mean... You know, what? keep an eye on your kid, you know? Uh, breaking news, as we talked about the Ariel Hawani situation, uh, one of my sources just texted me about a possible situation, and I've just read it from the Los Angeles Times here on my phone. It's been confirmed. The UFC has lifted his ban, ah. an SB Nation's ban. I'll read the quote from the Los Angeles Times and uh, Lance Pugmire uh, to give him his credit on his uh, article. The UFC on Monday lifted its indefinite ban on SB Nation MMA Fighting.com re- reporter Ariel Hawani, who was escorted out of the main before the main event of UFC 199. Following a conversation with the editorial team of SB Nation, the UFC will not prevent MMA Fighting.com from receiving media credentials to cover live events. A UFC spokesman wrote in a company statement emailed to reporters Monday night: "We respect the role." The media plays in our sport and beyond, including (laughs) MMA fighting's ability to report news. However, in our opinion, we believe that reoccurring tactics used by its lead reporter extended beyond its purpose of journalism, which was something that Ariel Hawani touched on, saying that the UFC had legitimately berated its employees, saying that there was a mole giving him information. Wow. Okay. We feel confident in our position has now been adequately communicated to SB Nation and their editorial team. <laughs> and then it goes on to talk about how Ariel okay, was so let go from Fox. Hold on. I was going to say, did they mention Ariel getting his credentials? So it, it says, <clears throat> uh, and then it talks about Ariel breaking the news of Connor, about Nate, about Brock. And it says, a Syracuse University journalist, alumni, and Ariel Hawani on Monday of his podcast, The MMA Hour, uh, had at least two sources on the story and takes pride in batting a thousand that he disputes in this case a comment by UFC spokesman Dave Scholler that he shouldn't have, have to consult with UFC officials before consulting about this story. When you know a story is massive about to break and is all but done deal, I don't think I need confirmation, says Hawani. I feel that most journalists out there would agree with me and it doesn't say in any handbook that I have to do that. He noted Friday night, UFC uh, President Dana White actually denied to Brett Okamoto, who is ESPN's.com leading MMA reporter, that they were bringing back Brock Lesnar. The UFC ultimately announced the McGregor fight as part of the broadcast, as well as Lesnar's return. While having his credentials removed, Hawani said he was told by White that he was too negative to exit the premises and go cover Bellator. It was very surreal. I felt like I was being watched as a dog. Uh, he said on the MMA Hour, as they watched us pack our things and literally walked us out. 
Detailing the scene on the seven-year-old show, Hawani was moved to tears at the end of nearly a two-hour show in which he discussed the history behind the band. I hope there will be some change, and I hope I can go back to how it was. <clears throat> Hawani said, it is hard to be told your career is over when you don't think you did any wrong. I'm not going anywhere, and it's going to take a whole lot more to get rid of me. There's nothing better than this sport and this job, and I'm proud of being a journalist. <laughs> he said he told his son before leaving for work Monday, don't let anyone push you around don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do something you can do whatever you want live your dreams i'm living mine it was a dream and i hope it can continue and i hope this can all be forgotten which was followed by the ufc statement which was noted the ufc's goal listen to this this is exactly what i said the ufc's goal as the world's leading mma promotion is to cultivate interest in the world-class athletes events and deliver this for the fans we will continue to introduce this sport and its athletes to new fans across the world and we will do so working alongside media on all platforms <laughs> touche okay hold on i got a breaking report here kimbo slice died In the ho oh he died he died wow dies at age 42 undisclosed reasons fought in february at the bellator 149 I saw some of the punches that guy took to the head. Uh, I just, fights. prior to that, I got a text saying that he was in dire straits. Yes, I, I, I saw that one, and this one just came through a second ago. Um, wow. Uh, he's a young guy, too. He's a young cat, 42. Yeah, man. What are we at on time there, Mr. Tech Guy? We're at one hour. Beautiful. Oh, nice. All right, so I'm going to bring in a new little small piece. If you want to call it a segment, we can call it a segment. But something to leave you with. Okay. Okay. That's what it's called? You can call it that if you want to. <laughs> I'm going to call it What to Watch For. Okay. Okay. ESPN has their <clears throat> What to Watch For. This is our version of that. Something you guys as listeners should look up. Since it's been a heavy UFC weekend and a heavy UFC day-to-day -day in our conversation between what happened with Ariel Hawani, now no longer banned <laughs> uh, in the course of 48 hours, um, go back and look up the Andre Orlovsky-Travis Brown fight. <laughs> from UFC 187. Uh, it actually was uh, a fight I knew nothing about until I picked up the best of 2015 DVD. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's two heavyweight guys that uh, if you don't know who Travis Brown is, uh, specifically, he's now Ronda Rousey's boyfriend. Um, and he's getting ready to fight Cain Velasquez at UFC 200. Watch his fight with Andre Orlovsky. You will be on the edge of your seat the whole time and totally excited within the first few minutes of this fight. It is crazy. Um, I don't want to tell you how it goes or how far it goes or anything like that so you can watch for yourself, but I promise you, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> so there's something to look Very back, good. something to look for. Very good. So as we finish things here, you got anything else? No, no. Uh, Gorilla Lives Matter. Keep uh, <laughs> that's a <laughs> is that an ESPN report? Uh, CBS. CBS report. Show that to me again. I'm gonna read the headline. Vegas strip club makes wild offer to Raiders, but only if they relocate. Yeah, oh. that, go, that goes hand in hand. <laughs> Glad I'm a Raider fan. Keep an eye on your kids. Uh, this world's a better place when we raise good kids, not uh, not free roaming kids. Kids understand two things, love and fear. If you teach them to fear you and then remind them that you love them, you don't go wrong, I don't think. On that note, it's Monday. We're headed to Friday. Yep. That's when we'll be back. Uh, There's a special and just, treat. And just so you can no longer push this back, <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you guys a heads up on a piece that we are doing on Friday. Uh, Manuel and I have discussed our knowledge of sports, and we will continue to on a regular basis on this podcast but him and I are competitive and it not only does it take place sometimes in conversation it happens in the weight room and it happens on the court or on the course depending on where we are so what we decided to do is bring it to the podcast I have five questions for Manuel that are all sports trivia he has five questions for me that are all sports trivia and we're going to go head to head and see who can answer out of the five more questions correctly and for the loser there is a nasty punishment that will be revealed on friday and uh to be honest it's no joke um it, it's no joke 
So I'll make sure that uh, that Friday that that is a, a piece that we are doing. It will be put up on Friday. We'll video the whole thing to be put on Instagram and uh, maybe even YouTube. We can if we can upload the video. We to can YouTube, do a short video on YouTube. We, yeah, yeah, we can put up the yeah. video on YouTube to go with the podcast yeah. on Friday. Tech guy shaking his head. It's doable. Sweet. All right. So uh, that's it for the Monday edition. We've been totally unprofessional. See you Friday. Mm-hmm.